And this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, the tech sell-off roars back into the markets, dragging shares down to the lowest in more than a month. We will chart the wild swings and break down the volatility. Plus, Blue Apron goes public to little fanfare. Why gutting its valuation before the IPO may not have been a winning recipe for the food delivery company and the growing challenges ahead. And 10 years ago today, the world was introduced to the iPhone, a trip down memory lane, and the changing faces of the smartphone that made Apple the world's most valuable company. First, to our lead. For the second time this week, we saw a sell-off in tech stocks, the Nasdaq losing more than a percent, set to snap its seven-month winning streak. The so-called FANG stocks, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Alphabet, weighing on the index. Joining us now from New York to help us dissect the decline, our Bloomberg News stocks reporter, Abigail Doolittle. So Abigail, tech, especially the big tech names down across the board, tell us about the biggest winners and losers. Well, you know, Emily, today was really very interesting from the standpoint that there was just tons of selling going on. The sellers were clearly in control. And I know that sounds very simple, but it's important to break it down that way because it confirms that that tech sell-off that started on June 9th is on. As you mentioned yesterday, we had a bit of a rebound, but now we're down in a big way for a second time this week, telling us again that investors are selling what has been, and in fact still is, the top sector on the year. What makes it really interesting, Emily, is the fact that, you know, I've talked to probably between half a dozen and a dozen buy-siders and uh, sell-siders. Nobody knows what's behind this, and for Wall Streeters to not have a theory or hypothesize, that's pretty rare. They pretty much always throw something out there. In fact, one buy-sider was calling it, quote-unquote, mysterious, the mysterious tech sell-off. One sell sider who's been on the street for quite some time, he made a good point. Some of this could be end of the quarter window dressing managers taking a profit. But even so, you know, it's pretty clear that we have a pretty big sentiment uh, change in sentiment here, jitters and uncertainty on the part of investors. And the FANG trade, Emily, that you were talking about, this is pretty amazing. This has been the top trade all year, really a hot sector with all of the names, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Alphabet up more than 30%. Now really dipping down. You can see that in this chart in the Bloomberg that we're taking a look at G hashtag BTV 6742 and Jatendra Worrell, Bloomberg intelligence analyst who's really great on these names. I said, what's behind this fundamentally? He said nothing has changed at all. The only thing that he could talk about here was the fact that we're seeing this rotation out of tech into banks. So some of that uh, money is going into the banks. Another point to be made, actually, though, Emily, very interesting. Ben Emmons over at Intellect as Partners, he said, while we have the FANG stock selling off, if you take a look at the FANG bonds, they're fine. So from that standpoint, that supports the, the ideas for the fund fundamentals for these uh, big tech companies are just fine. It's just jitters on the part of stock investors more so. Now, there were a couple of bright spots in the tech session. Tell us which ones. Well, this is pretty funny, Emily. You wouldn't guess it. Snap and Fitbit. So these are relatively recent IPOs, uh, companies that some investors may not have a lot of uh, uh, confidence in, in a way, know whether the growth is there, whether the revenue and the profit that Wall Street's looking for. But both of these stocks were up on the day. So that's sort of an interesting uh, divergence that these higher beta names, Fitbit has a beta of more than two, Emily, uh, uh, outperformed on the day. Investors going for some of those gamier names. And I did ask Jatendra Worrell about those two, and he said he had no clue what was going on there. So who knows, Emily? We have this big risk off session, but some investors going for, again, those more high momentum uh, tech names. All right, we'll see what Friday holds. Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle. Thanks, Abigail, for that update. Now, June 29th marks the iPhone's 10th birthday. While it wasn't the world's first smartphone, it jumped far beyond the competition and propelled the mobile revolution, spurring rapid changes in industries of all kinds and society as a whole. Here's a look back at the decade of the iPhone. Today, Apple is going to reinvent the phone. On June 29th, 2007, consumers got their hands on the very first iPhone. Now, a decade later, the smartphone has proven to be the undisputed king of Apple products and in turn revolutionized an entire ecosystem, destroying heavyweights of the day and spurring new rivals across the globe like Oppo and Xiaomi. The iPhone also opened doors to what has become a large chunk of the company's revenue, apps. App sales have generated roughly $100 billion in gross revenue for Apple, with more than 16 million developers worldwide producing apps ranging from Uber to Snapchat. 
The launch of the iPhone didn't just change the way people work and socialize, it also transformed the company itself. Apple grew by every dimension, going from a company with staff of around 18,000 pre-iPhone to a workforce of 116,000 in 2016. And sales for Apple went from $19 billion in 2006 to over $215 billion a decade later. It doesn't stop there. Since its launch, Apple has sold about 1.3 billion iPhones, generating more than $800 billion in revenue. That blows other iconic devices out of the water including Nintendo's Game Boy, which sold over 118 million units in its lifetime, and Sony Walkman, which sold a little over 200 million in a 38-year period. But with that astronomical growth rate comes heavy dependence. The iPhone makes up a whopping 63% of revenue for Apple, making it the company's most crucial product. Some tech heavyweights are sounding the alarm about the future of smartphones, with longtime Silicon Valley investor Peter Thiel saying he doesn't think there will be any more innovation here. It's clear that Apple CEO Tim Cook sees it differently. I think we're just getting started. And uh, so I'm, I'm incredibly excited. And, and clearly there's nothing that uh, I think virtually anybody would say uh, is going to replace a smartphone anytime soon. As Apple looks toward the next decade and the competition stays red hot, a major question remains. How long can the iPhone remain at Apple's core? Joining now to dig into the iPhone's first decade and the decade ahead is my guest co-host for the hour, Techonomy CEO and our Bloomberg contributing editor, David Kirkpatrick, who is in New York. David, as always, thank you for joining us. Good to be here. It is hard to sum up the iPhone, but in your view, what is the biggest significance of this 10th birthday? Well, you almost can't come up with enough superlatives for the iPhone as a business success. I would say you have to say it is the most successful product ever, period, in business history. 800 billion in sales for one thing, that's unheard of. So I think just the sheer financial gravity of how the iPhone has been a business success combined with the way that it has shifted the nature of our behavior, that's astonishing. Now, I know you've been doing some thinking about what hasn't the iPhone changed about our lives? Or what it's changed perhaps for the worse. I mean, let's face it, um, we all walk around looking down like this. I mean, in New York, people just bump into each other on the sidewalk constantly. You, you can often be in, in, a, in a public place and look around and literally every person in the space is looking down at a smartphone. They're not all iPhones, some of them are Androids. But look, this has changed our behavior in wonderful ways. It's allowed us to do all kinds of things in the economy we couldn't do otherwise. And I think that's unimpeachably beneficial. But let's admit that it has changed our behavior in some negative ways and in some ways taken us away from the interaction and the awareness of our surroundings that used to be a sort of essential part of being human and we don't want to lose that. You know, it's interesting. We had Gene Munster on the show recently who thinks that iPhone sales will peak in 2019 and that the next big product from Apple will be augmented reality glasses and I wonder a, if that's true how that will change this particular behavior you're referring to. Well, it's certainly one of the reasons a lot of people are excited about augmented reality is that if it could somehow be implemented properly, which I don't think anyone has yet seen, it would potentially give us the ability to effectively be online and be in the real world at the same time. And I think that's part of the reason that people like Mark Zuckerberg are so excited about it. I do think Tim Cook may be among the few people in tech who would say nobody can imagine anything replacing the smartphone anytime soon. A lot of people are imagining a lot of stuff, including those people up in Seattle at Amazon, where their voice interface echo devices have uh, made some impact. Facebook just uh, announced hitting 2 billion users, and you say that the future of Facebook and the iPhone go hand in hand. Well, I think they've gone hand in hand all along. I mean, when people use the iPhone for what they're saying, soon two hours a day, the, when people are looking down at those phones, the single thing they're looking down at the most is Facebook. So, you know, if Facebook hadn't come along, I think it's quite possible the smartphone would not have become the phenomenon that it did. These two phenomena have really been joined at the hip. 
uh, and I think they will be for the future. But it is interesting, again, to go back to Zuckerberg and his thoughts about augmented and virtual reality. He's already thinking about other interfaces, other physical devices, which might be a minor concern for Apple. On the other hand, short term, Apple's still in the catbird seat, no question. All right, uh, so much to reflect on oh, yeah. here on the iPhone's 10th birthday. David Kirkpatrick, Techonomy CEO, you are sticking with me for the hour. Well, a major setback for Rupert Murdoch. The UK government is pushing back on the media tycoon's attempt to create a transatlantic media and entertainment giant. 21st Century Fox's $15 billion bid to take full control of Sky will now undergo additional scrutiny by regulators. The government says it's concerned by the growing impact of the Murdoch family on media plurality. Coming up, Blue Apron makes its public debut. We discuss the meal kit delivery startup's journey to IPO and the challenges ahead. And Bloomberg Tech is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV, weekdays 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. Shares of Blue Apron made their public debut Thursday, but the stock gave a muted performance in its first day of trading, literally unchanged by the end of the session. This after the company lowered its IPO price to $10 a share from an initial range of $15 to $17. The meal kit delivery company raised $300 million from the offering, giving it a market value of $2 billion. For more, our Bloomberg News IPO reporter Alex Barinka joins us from New York and still with us, David Kirkpatrick, our guest host for the hour. So, Alex, what happened? How much does it have to do with Amazon and Whole Foods? A good bit of this uh, does have to do with Amazon Whole Foods. And you saw that big price cut happen on the roadshow before these shares priced down to this $10 level. But, you know, looking at the trading today, the fact that it was actually unchanged. It closed at $10 a share. We had some aftermarket trade at about $9.95 below the IP. Price. It seems like uh, there's a bit more investor concern baked in as well. The initial valuation they went out at, at a $3.2 billion market value at the high end, that's what they were trying to get when they launched this IPO, w did not come to fruition. Right now they're sitting at a $1.9 billion market valuation. And if I'm an investor, I'm sitting back, I'm looking at this company, I'm saying, where's the growth? And I'm saying, how are you going to afford it? Because frankly, when I look at this cash position, uh, it seems like they actually might need some money soon. So some of that could be uh, a, a playing into this uh, downward or very flat pressure for Blue Apron shares. David, should investors be concerned about Blue Apron simply because of Amazon Whole Foods or because of all these other things that Alex has mentioned? Well, I think that if I were in any kind of food delivery related business, I would be watching Amazon with incredible care. And the fact that they bought Whole Foods, which surprised most of us, I think just goes to show the seriousness with which they view food as, as you know, a part of their conquer the world and all the world strategy. So yes, I do think so. I think they should worry, seriously. Alex, uh, should there be any more scrutiny on how the bankers handled this IPO in particular, not knowing that uh, Amazon Whole Foods was coming? So it seems like they did what they had to. I was, I've been talking to folks who are around the deal, not around the deal, who are in the industry. And look, if they launched the deal when they did three days after the Amazon announcement, or if they waited until perhaps after Labor Day, th this idea of Amazon Whole Foods is still going to be there. Uh, the valuation they went out at is very strong. As we talked about, it was uh, valued at more richly than most of the e-commerce companies out there. So the valuation point um, made some folks scratch their heads. So it seems like they did what they needed to do to get the deal done. And frankly, Blue Apron needs cash. If you look back at their first quarter uh, cash uh, situation, they had $61 million on hand. They're spend, they spent, uh, they had free cash flow deficit of $74 million in that quarter. And they told investors in the S1, look, we have cash and borrowings to get us to at least 12 months of runway. That's not a ton of time. So this is a company that is having to outmarket its competitors, now being Amazon Whole Foods and others, and is continuing to try to build out its uh, logistics network and its fulfillment center. So they needed the money. So whether you wait a few months or you go out now, it's always going to be a question of valuation to actually get the deal done.
All right, Alex, what does this mean for tech deal making and IPO plans going forward? It's coming back down to that valuation point. It seems like we've had a lot of the tech deal uh, pipeline for the smaller companies work their way through. You got uh, some kind of lofty valuations there because investors were chasing these returns. And now it seems like a bit of realism is starting to sink back into the market. In this niche in particular, this deal, this Blue Apron deal, casts a, a, a shadow underneath the massive shadow of Amazon uh, on exits in particular. You've got Sunbasket that's trying to go out. You've got all of these uh, smaller firms that venture capitalists have thrown money into in the food delivery space. So if you're thinking about exit valuation and, and you're behind the scenes on a management team, you've got to be saying we've got to get our books in order. We've got to get our house in order to prove that we're not Blue Apron and we're not going to exit, frankly, less than our last private round valuation. All right. Alex Barinka, our Bloomberg News IPO reporter, thanks so much. David Kirkpatrick, Techonomy CEO, you're sticking with me. Coming up, Uber's management issues have overshadowed all other problems the ride-hailing company continues to face. We will bring you the latest out of the Uber Weibo legal battle next. This is Bloomberg. Korean tech giant Samsung announced investments worth $1.9 billion in two U.S. plants. Samsung will spend $1.5 billion on its semiconductor factory in Texas and build a $380 million plant in South Carolina for home appliances. Both investments will be carried out until 2020, according to statements from the company. The announcements came just ahead of Korean President Moon Jae-in's first summit with the U.S. president, who has been vocal, a vocal critic of a free trade agreement, and described it as a one-way street. Well, Uber is back in the spotlight, this time in the courtroom as the Uber Waymo saga continues. In a new filing, the ride-sharing company, ride-hailing company, says it was unaware of Waymo data theft prior to the lawsuit. Uber is seeking to refute Waymo's claim that it conspired with Anthony Lewandowski to download 14,000 files and steal trade secrets before he left Waymo in January 2016. For more, we're joined now by our Bloomberg Legal reporter, Joel Rosenblatt, who's been at these hearings, you've been inside the courtroom and you think that Uber's assertion that they didn't know these files were stolen is extremely important. Why? It's just the first time that they've been able to really stand up and say, hey, look at these 14,000 files that are at the center of the lawsuit. We knew nothing about them until the complaint was filed. That it just came as kind of a big surprise. It's a big, it's a change. It's a big change in, in kind of the direction of the lawsuit. And it kind of reveals something about Uber's strategy going forward as well. So does this tip the scales in favor of Uber? No, I wouldn't go that far. It's just that we're used to seeing Uber being kicked around in the courtroom, like reliably kicked around every time they st stand in court. And uh, the, because the judge believes that Anthony Lewandowski stole those files and that Uber is maybe responsible somehow. So they've always been on the kind of receiving end of the judge's ire, and this is kind of just, you can feel it in the courtroom. It's just changed the, the tide a little bit. David Kirkpatrick, Tech Economy CEO, still with us. It's amazing, David, that Uber is going through this amidst everything else, the CEO leaving the company. You know, what do you make of this sideline courtroom battle? Well, it's hard to believe anything that Uber says these days, and it's easy to imagine the worst of this company that's just got such a long list of malfeasance that we know of. Now, this it could very well be that they didn't know that this guy that they hired was a dishonest thief, even though they you know paid him 250 million and he turned out to be you know a thief. Uh, and they're saying, well, it wasn't us that stole it; it was him. Uh, so they're sort of throwing him to the wolves in that sense. Uh, I think that's very possible. But I still think it's the culture of Uber that he knew he was going into to think that it was okay to do that. And that's worth thinking about for us that continue to think about whether we should use Uber, whether we should invest in it, et cetera. Um, but, you know, Joel's the one who knows what's happening in the courtroom. I'm just profoundly skeptical of everything Uber. And certainly Lewandowski comes off horribly in this whole thing. Now, Uber might be able to salvage a little bit of the reputation here. Take us into the courtroom, Joel. Tell us about the mood and the difference in uh, the Uber and Waymo teams. Well, like I said, until now, um, the mood has been Uber is just always on the receiving end of this stuff because I agree, Anthony Lewandowski is still in 
potentially very deep trouble. Mm -hmm. And uh, Uber hired him. In the courtroom today, even though you know we've explained that they've distanced themselves from these 14,000 files, didn't know about it until the lawsuit was filed. The the court in the courtroom today, they're making this kind of tricky argument that well, maybe their lawyers knew or a firm that it hired to kind of investigate Anthony Lewandowski before it hired them knew, but th there's an insinuation that maybe they told the lawyers or the firm that they hired, look, whatever you find out about Anthony Lewandowski, don't tell us, okay? So it, there's, there's always this kind of, They've changed the tide a little bit, but it's always through trickery, seems like trickery or tr tricky lawyering. So what can you glean about Uber's trial strategy going forward? They've been very, they've come out with what seems to be their, their strategy now. They've, they've laid it out now, which is the theme anyway, that they would present to a jury, which is, look, we're guilty of hiring Anthony Lewandowski, okay? That and that, and so you could see how that would play with the jury. It's like, well, that's what that's what they did. I mean, as as, as kind of dirty as the guy may be or may seem, the lawsuit is not against Anthony Lewandowski; it's against Uber. Uber's the defendant, and so we're guilty of that. We're not guilty of trade secret theft. All right, Joel Rosenblatt, our legal reporter, giving us all the juicy details from inside the courtroom. Thank you, David Kirkpatrick, Techonomy CEO. You're staying with me. Coming up, we dig deeper into the NASDAQ sell-off as tech reaches sky-high valuations. Are markets going to pull back? And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com. You can listen in the U.S. at SiriusXM. This is Bloomberg. I'm Elisa Parenti in Washington, and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's begin with a check of your first word news. In a move that will likely anger China, the State Department has approved arms sales to Taiwan worth $1.3 billion. It's the first deal with a self-governing island since President Trump took office. Congress was notified of the sale today. Lawmakers have 30 days to object. Chinese President Xi Jinping continues his first trip to Hong Kong since being sworn in back in 2012. He's there to mark the 20th anniversary of the British colony's return to Chinese rule. The territory's new leader, Carrie Lam, will be sworn in Saturday. President Xi is expected to leave after attending that ceremony. In Moscow, a jury of five men, a jury found five men guilty in the murder of Russian opposition leader Boris Nimtsov. Nimtsov, a top opponent of President Vladimir Putin, was killed while walking near the Kremlin in 2015. Police in Australia have charged Pope Francis's financial advisor with multiple sexual assault offenses. Cardinal George Pell is the highest ranking Vatican official ever charged in the Catholic Church's long running sexual abuse scandal. Iraq says it has reclaimed the landmark mosque in the city of Mosul, gutted last week by Islamic State. Iraqi troops are pushing through the last neighborhood in that city, still held by Islamic extremists. In 2014, Islamic State declared a self-styled caliphate on territories in Iraq and Syria at that mosque. Global News 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Elisa Parenti. This is Bloomberg. It's just after 5.30 p.m. Thursday here in Washington, already 7.30 Friday morning in Sydney. We are joined by Bloomberg's David Fickling with a look at the markets. David, good morning to you. Good morning, yes, and futures on local indexes are pointing down uh, following the, the track down of U.S. markets. 1.2% uh, down for futures on the local Australian SPY index today uh, and down 1.1% in Japan on, on the Nikkei. Uh, we'll be looking today at some of China's PMI data coming out in just over three hours' time. Um, this is, uh, was, has been at some of its strongest levels in almost three years, 51.2 last year. Economists are expecting 51 uh, this month. Uh, we'll see if uh, a slightly weaker reading takes some of the wind out of the sales of iron ore, which is up 14% uh, so far uh, so far this week. That's the main things we're going to be looking at today. Uh, I'm David Fickling. I'm handing back to Bloomberg Technology next from Sydney.
Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. Our top story today, the sell-off in tech stocks. For the second time this week, the Nasdaq losing more than a percent and on track to break its seven-month winning streak. Joining us now to help make sense of the recent gyrations, Bloomberg Markets reporter Danny Berger, still with us as well, Techonomy CEO David Kirkpatrick. Danny, let's start with you. The fundamentals of these companies haven't changed at all. Why are investors suddenly down on tech? Right, that is the big question. I mean, this year we've seen continued violent rotations in the stock market and tech is now the latest casualty you'll remember we did have that sell off in tech a couple weeks ago one thing that I think we have to keep in mind here is how ubiquitous semiconductors and tech stocks are in today's economy so when you think about the Federal Reserve nerves there about uh, are we ready to raise interest rates will that affect the economy I think that tech is one area that you're increasingly seeing investors play the tech stocks uh, and that rotation uh, one thing I do want to point out those just how popular tech stocks were so if we jump into the Bloomberg here I brought with me a chart that's a really cool function you can do as a scatter plot so each one of those dots is a is a stock in the Nasdaq 100 one line shows uh, its yearly return the other one shows its one day percent return so if you stick with me here basically what you can see is the most popular stocks over the past year sold off the most today so again the most loved stocks now are the most hated so we're seeing this rotation where people are selling off these momentum -y positions maybe thinking hey uh, it's a bit uh, overbought uh, it looks stretched maybe now is the time to take profits with perhaps no specific catalyst we can really point to at this moment. So no specific catalyst, David. You wonder, tech has been peaking, is the best behind it? Well, absolutely not. I mean, I do think tech may increasingly be seen as sort of a so popular with investors and so central to the economy that its movements are kind of a macroeconomic indicator of sentiment. But long term, tech has so much to go, it's crazy. I mean, my opinion, the FANG stocks, with the possible exception of Netflix, these companies are, have such unbelievable headroom. They are dominating the economy. They're going to go to the moon. I, I hate to say it. You might say they're already at the moon. Look at it in five years. I Just quickly, I, Yuri Milner, I interviewed on stage in Paris a week and a half ago. He has this theory based on the percentage of the economy that is digital, and if it, which he says is 6% today. All it has to do is go to 15% by 2025, and he says $4 trillion more will be created in consumer Internet market cap. So I think he's probably in the right direction there. So, Danny, put it into perspective for us. Is tech overcrowded? Yeah, so I want to point to something that actually really speaks to uh, what David was just talking about. So another chart I have for you here uh, shows the market cap of tech as it relates to the S&P 500. So again, this is the percent weight of tech in the S&P 500. Uh, that yellow line there is the average and uh, over the past decade, and you can see we're far above that. Now keep in mind, if I had expanded this back to the tech bubble, which here I'm going to do quickly for you, you can see that we're still far, far below that. So we've got some ways to go before that waiting looks sort of bubbly. But, I mean, this is an increasingly an important part of the market. Um, it's, it's dominating the S&P. So we have days like today where tech sells off and it really hurts the S&P 500 as a whole. But however, tech, this volatility is whipping up and still we are seeing the market remain calm. Uh, so still a bit of a difference there. Tech isn't doing anything right now to completely cause trading to go into a frenzy at this moment. All right. Our markets reporter, Danny Berger, there with the roundup. Thanks so much, Danny. And Techonomy CEO, David Kirkpatrick, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. As always. Coming up, as the iPhone celebrates its 10th birthday, we'll hear from Tony Fidel, founder of Nest and often referred to as the godfather of the iPod. And tune into Bloomberg on July 4th, 8 a.m. Eastern. Alex Steele, Carol Masser, and Matt Miller will co-host the Boston Pops Fireworks Spectacular live from Boston's historic Esplanade. This is Bloomberg. Let's return now to our coverage of the iPhone turning 10. Back in 2007, Steve Jobs took to the stage to unveil the latest product. The new smartphone combined email, web browsing, texting, and of course phone calls in a single device. He demoed the product with Apple's head of design, Johnny Ive. Johnny, do you have anything to say on the first phone call? 
it's it's uh, it's not too shabby, is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's not too shabby. <laughs> Tony Fidel, another key executive of the Apple team at the time of the first iPhone launch, spoke to Bloomberg's Caroline Conan at the opening of Station F, a startup campus in Paris. Let's go back 10 years ago, what the world looked like. 10 years ago, we had all different brands of cell phones. Today, almost every single seller of cell phones is totally different than it was 10 years ago. 10 years ago, we didn't even have 3G networks. Now people are talking about 5G and 6G networks because we can't get enough data and communications everywhere on the planet. We didn't have all the servers and cloud computing 10 years ago. Now it's everywhere. We didn't have you know ride sharing services like Lyft or Deliveroo, Deliveroo delivering things. Everything about our world has changed in just 10 years since that first iPhone. So think about that, just 10 years. So what is the next 10 years going to be like? But if we really think about why we're here at Station F today, Station F is here because of the mobile revolution that started 10 years ago. All of the companies in here are all bu building on top of that platform that we've collectively built as a society on top of these smartphones that are in 2 billion people's hands, computers for everyone. And so I am, you know, really excited about, you know, what else is going to come in 10 years. But yes, we kicked it off 10 years ago, and it's wonderful to be here seeing what that has created for countries all around the world, including France. Uh, some say that uh, Apple and the iPhone may have lost uh, a little bit of its uh, innovative touch. What's your take on this? I, I, you know, let's 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 roll the clock back to to uh, laptops or computers before that. You know, when we look at laptops, you'd say, oh, laptops have stagnated. They were stagnated in the 90s and the 2000s, and it was they were the same as ever. But what did they get? They got internet. They got email. They got all these other applications. Well, look at the iPhone and look at smartphones in general. They change every day with the apps you download and the services that are created on top of that platform. So if you were to say, you know laptops stagnated well not really they were just an enabling platform for all these other things to be created the same thing goes in mobile phones and, and smartphones we have lots of innovation it's not just about the phone you carry but it's all the things it can do and literally every day you get a new feature a new function the iPhone is roughly 63 percent of Apple's revenues uh, uh, do you think the company is too dependent on a single product oh I think it's continuing to build other businesses and, and innovating so for me you know new platforms Platforms take a long time. The last platform before the iPhone was the Macintosh, right? And that was in 1984, and that took you know 20 years. So we're just seeing the beginnings, uh, or the you know the first 10 years of this platform. So to create another worldwide sensation like that, it takes time, and it takes a. We're still trying to adapt to the one we've just built in 10 years. So I, you know, I think everyone needs to, you know, I, I think we're all excited, but you know, it takes a long time to do something really important and impactful. Do you actually believe that the next iPhone could come from a place like this, Station F in Paris? And what will it look like? Will it be a smartphone? Well, I think, you know, I don't know what it's going to look like. I'm not a great pr predictor of the future by any means, because I would have never told you 10 years ago when the iPhone shipped, it would have, the world would look like it, it, it does today. So I can't predict the future. But what I can tell you is that when we look at these devices and we look at, you know, the future, I am really intrigued by what's happened in over the last seven, eight years. If we look at the DNA of devices pre-iPhone or pre-Android handsets, almost all the software code, all the hardware, was all locked up with a few companies. The DNA to create a computer, to create an operating system, applications, was all locked inside of Apple or Microsoft or who have you. Today, with open source, both on the cloud side and on the mobile handset side, and all the different services, cloud services, and the commoditization of the cell phone, if you look at it, now everyone can evolve around the world, new phones, new products, and they have the opportunity just like Silicon Valley did the last 20 years. That was Tony Fidel, co-founder of Next and the former Apple executive. Staying with the iPhone, President Donald Trump has pressured Apple to build a production line here in the United States. Bloomberg Gadfly's Tim Culpin takes a look at what it would look like if the company could assemble its smartphone here in the U.S. 
Take a look at the back of any iPhone and you'll see a familiar phrase that's been printed on almost a billion units of the iconic product. Designed by Apple in California, assembled in China. Like everything at Apple, that wording is deliberate. Apple designs the exterior, writes the software, researches new technologies, and develops its own chips in California, which allows it to sell devices for 65% more than their cost. But iPhones are assembled in China for a reason. It's easy to assume that reason is cheaper labor. While wages are lower, this doesn't tell the whole story. In fact, assembly is only 2% of an iPhone's hardware cost. Today, most iPhones are made in two Chinese cities, Shenzhen and Zhengzhou. Favorable government policies helped Shenzhen become the electronics factory to the world, with Taiwanese company Foxconn its biggest employer. As a result, thousands of companies and millions of workers have moved to this southern Chinese city to be close to the action. During peak iPhone season, Foxconn hires almost a million people, cutting its workforce to a few hundred thousand during low season. Such a cluster effect in Shenzhen means that most of the components need to make a phone, a laptop or a drone are within a 50 mile radius. Attempts to recreate this cluster have so far failed. Brazil is the perfect example. Apple is facing high import tariffs in Brazil and urged Foxconn to make iPhones there. After securing local incentives, Foxconn built a factory, but very little changed. Rather than doing lots of high-level manufacturing in Brazil, Foxconn continued to do most of the work back in China, where the supply chain was nearby and parts could be pre-assembled. This meant that most of an iPhone was made in China and merely shipped to Brazil for local workers to slot together, like Lego. In the end, the Brazil project failed on two levels. It hired a fraction of the workers the government had expected, and it didn't attract any of Apple's hundreds of suppliers. If an iPhone is to be made in the US, it's more likely to follow the Brazil model, not the Shenzhen model, which means far fewer jobs. And for those workers, making for Apple would be as seasonal as picking apples. So while the US could one day boast an iPhone assembled in America, the question is, does it really want to? Tim Culpin there, a Bloomberg Gadfly. Well, don't be fooled by Tim Cook's 2016 reported pay of $8.75 million, which ranked the Apple CEO in the bottom third of all CEOs in the S&P 500. Cook actually took home $145 million, almost all of it from awards granted back in 2011. He isn't the only CEO of a publicly traded U.S. company to cross that $100 million threshold for take-home pay. Reed Hastings of Netflix reaped $106 million last year. Coming up, we take a look at a group of activist hackers on the front lines in protecting elections from tampering. More on that story next. This is Bloomberg. Xavier Neal wants to put Paris on par with Silicon Valley for tech investing and innovation. The French billionaire entrepreneur opened Station F, a 360,000 square foot startup co-working space next to the Seine. Companies including Facebook, Microsoft and venture capital firms have vowed to make staff available at the campus to advise entrepreneurs. We hope that we will have the next Facebook and we have and we created programs we are completely different. For example, we have a thing called fighter programs where we are looking for young people coming from the poor suburb outside of Paris or uh, in some other places and uh, help them to come and to create their company. The French capital is trying to best position itself as uncertainty looms around London post Brexit. Well, from imperfect voting machines to fake news, many countries like the United States and France are only beginning to wrestle with the ways in which democracy can be hacked. Though one country has taken an unusual path to combat election hacking efforts, and that is Germany. The nation utilizes a group called the Chaos Computer Club, a tech-focused watchdog assembly. Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde recently spoke with Bloomberg News reporter Vernon Silver from Rome, who reported on this story as part of this week's Bloomberg Business Week Global Tech Issue. She started by asking how exactly the Chaos Computer Club helps the German government. 
The interesting thing is we're looking at the data of which countries had the worst uh, levels of fake news. Oxford had done some research that put really high levels in the U.S. and the U.K., but there was a blip in the data, which was Germany, where the levels of professionally produced news versus other political items was, you know, really high. It was really, looked really good. And one place we looked was hackers themselves. And there's the Chaos Computer Club, which is an organization founded in the early 1980s that for generations has helped sort of instill uh, a healthy dose of skepticism and you know tech savviness uh, among Germans. So what sort of hacks and roles has the has the so-called Chaos Computer Club actually done to shine a light on where maybe some of the weaknesses are in Germany? Yeah, what, they, what they've done is, with a, a bit of humor sometimes, taken on things like, for example, the voting machines themselves. A decade ago, when Germany was starting to roll out voting computers, they said, with kind of a boast, I bet we could make one of these play chess, and the, the manufacturer said, oh yeah, I'd like to see that. And within about a month, not only had they shown that you could manipulate the votes on the voting computers, uh, but you could actually make it play chess. They did that, although they said it didn't play chess particularly well. Um, but the real result was a decision by the Constitutional Court in Germany that cited the Chaos Computer Club, you can read it in their decision, um, in, in rolling back what was going to be a rollout of, of voting computers. And so therefore when we're looking at the role that these hackers can play in the upcoming German election, is there concern in Germany about the role of fake news? Is that perhaps not something they're even so concerned about considering the blip as you say in the data? Yeah, there is. I think there's there's heightened uh, concern in Germany, partly because of uh, Germany's history. There are laws against hate speech. There have been uh, that are part of Germany's history in addressing past problems, obviously. And also, the government now, Merkel's government, has threatened the social media companies with fines if they don't get the fake news phenomena under control. Um, the role that a hacker collective with thousands of members, like the Chaos Computer Club, has has been one of raising awareness. Their leadership has gone out there. One thing they did for me in just you know, 15, 20 minutes was show me how a, a Twitter bot works. And I thought that I could recognize what a real uh, Twitter account was, you know, plus or minus a few percentage you know, on, on being able to get fooled. But it, it was so easy. And this is what they're doing with lots of journalists and with the public, showing that anybody can really do it and essentially build a bot army of hundreds uh, spreading fake news and other propaganda if they wanted. And, that, and that, that's sort of the role with their hacker persona that they've been playing. The Chaos Computer Club, just talk to us a little bit about how much this could in fact be replicated. Could we see it in, used as a device potentially in other countries that have become more succumbed to, to fake news? Because how formal is the arrangement that they have? Yeah, I mean, this is this. What's interesting is what's developed in Germany is is kind of unique. Uh, one because it's been around so long since the early '80s uh, that it's gotten this role as a social activist, human rights organization, actually, um, and also again because of Germany's history with Nazism, with uh, communism in East Germany and the Stasi secret police. That there's a real aversion to surveillance and then the role that the the state can play. So that sort of the the fertile ground in Germany for having a Hacker resistance is is much is much better and, and maybe not something that could be replicated in other places. Although there is something to be said for it being emulated. Our Bloomberg News reporter Vernon Silver there. Well, finally, Airbnb is said to be planning a new tier of luxury vacation rentals. The company will test a rental service for mansions and penthouses at the end of the year, with a broad rollout planned if successful. The rentals will all face inspection to maintain quality standards. Earlier this year, Airbnb acquired Canada's luxury retreats, which lists more than 4,000 villas and vacation homes. And we will be covering this topic on Friday's show with Chris Lehane, Airbnb's head of global policy and public affairs. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. All episodes, as always, live streaming on Twitter. You can check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. That is all for now. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.